is David Lichtenstein, and welcome to the Yeshiva Shalmaila. This week we're going to be discussing a very interesting topic. I don't know if it's ever been discussed. Down syndrome, autism, other children with infirmities in halacha and hashkafa. We have a fabulous program. I mean, here are some of the questions uh, we're going to be speaking about. Um, keeping the child at home or giving it up for either adoption to another family or to an institution. What is the Torah's halacha? What are anhashkaf on it? Oh, here's another interesting one. For those who are makayim pru revu ready, there's now an extensive body of research, which, you know, I say extensive, we're going to have on two physicians who research this topic, but I can't say you have to do your own research today. It's easily done. Should they take the greatly increased chance of autism, Down syndrome, etc., of parents who are over the age of 40. Women as, as young as 38 have far greater significance. Men over the age of 45, I think research says, has a 6x, 600% chance of having a Down syndrome or an autistic child. What's the halacha on it? I want to, by the way, preface this. This is just for being Ma'ira the Shaila. Everybody has their own Rabbanim, their own Dayanim, their own Rosh Hashivas. Please, an absolute disclaimer over here. We're going to be speaking about in utero, should testing be done? What's the opinion of the G'daylam about aborting? What about making a toiva hametiv or a shachianu if it's a boy or a girl when the child is born? Uh, is the child l'chuyiv b'mitzvah? Right? We're going to be speaking about marriage. Can a Down syndrome child surprising answers? What about even having children? We're going to have from Eretz Yisrael, the number one expert on all Shilas Rafur alive today probably is Rabbi Avram Steinberg. He's a world famous Rav and Doctor. He's probably the biggest expert in the world. He wrote the Encyclopedia for Halacha and Rafur, which is used as a canon for Abonimus. He's actually written two sets of Farm seven or nine volumes each on Rafur. He was uh, for many years at Shari Tzedek. He was a Talmud, almost a Talmud cover of Shlomo Zalman Ayabach, by the way, whose yard site is this week. I believe it's on Monday for those who are into yard sites. So it's a great honor to have Rabbi Stammer. I think it's going to be the first time he's ever on the air uh, to discuss these topics. We will have from Brooklyn, Rav Baruch Rabinowitz, a Talmud of Ramayshi Shapiro, who Ramayshi Shapiro wrote the famous letter to him. He has a Down syndrome child. And what the Belushev Rebbe and Shmuel Kamenetsky called that letter, the Torah Shabal Peh, for, ch- for this, uh, for this, in this matter. It's just a, an incredible letter. He will actually read the letter for us, the way he under- you know, he will paraphrase it, but because it's written in Hebrew, for our Olam on the ear. We will have two physicians, Dr. Elon Shapiro and Dr. Henke, who both are, you know, experts, have spoken about the field. The, the, Dr. Shapiro is on CNN, NBC, et cetera, often talking about this. So it should be a very interesting program. I do want to give a, number, a disclaimer beforehand. It says, when Moshe sees the sneh burning, it says, Sal na'alecha me'al raglecha, the makem ashat oymet shamad bezkaydesh, you take your shoes off. And the Velt learns pshat, I saw, I saw a beautiful pshat. You know, a burning bush, what does the Medrash say? It refers to Kali Yisrael as huddled and burning pain. Which is when you speak about matters that are of pain and great sensitivity, take your shoes off, tread very carefully. You know, when a person is wearing hiking boots, they can go up mountains and on rocks and on cliffs. The removal of the shoes is the Torah's way of saying, tread very carefully. In the Harabayas, you have to take your shoes off. You can't be a bovian in the Harabayas. You have to, the, over here you step, you have karas. Here, right? Every. So, so I want to apologize in advance. Anybody who has a child who is down, autistic, or suffers in any way, or anybody who feels that this is too sensitive a topic, or I didn't handle it with appropriate sensitivity, I apologize in advance. I ask you for mechila. That's my hagdama to this. I want to share with you two thoughts. It says, you know, by Avram Avinu, it says, V'hine ayil achar nechaz b'svach. Uh, he, he's going to be makriv by the Akedah, Yitzchak Avinu, the Rabbi Nishalom tells him, stop. The Malach says, Malach Alekim says, stop. So he says, he looks up and he says, Ayel Achanechaz Besvach, an Ayel. Now, which Ayel was this? The Ayel of Sheshis Yimei Bereshis, says, Erev Shabbos, Bein Hashmoshis. This Ayel was Nivra. God created it, Erev Shabbos, for this particular occasion. 
So imagine how beautiful the sile was. You know, hunters talk about uh, six-point antlers. It's like a nine. This is the most imp- This is the Isle of Creation. Imagine a gorgeous. So just imagine the scene. The Isle is stuck in the brambles, and there's somebody watching from the distance. And who is this person? He's an animal rights activist. He's a humanist. He cares about Tsar Balechayim. He cares about, you know, pain. He cares, right? And he sees the most beautiful animal ever, and there's somebody running towards it, who obviously is a hunter, a shaykhet, a ramavinu. So he takes out his, he stands up, he starts screaming at the top of his lungs, Ayel, Ayel, run for your life. What a, what a terrible tragedy this would be. It's like, remember they killed last year some lion in, in Rhodesia, was a, and the whole world mourned, this is, run, run. And to his, imagine to his chagrin, he sees Avramavinu take the Ayel catch and shecht it. And this guy went home and he told his wife, he says, I, I push it, I'm sick. You can't believe the scene that I saw. I saw this magnificent aisle. Now somebody else, why, another person looking at it is saying, wait, 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 wait. This aisle has been standing there, stuck in the brambles, you know how long? For over 2,000 years. Erev Shabbos, my sabratius. And what's he waiting? He's waiting for this moment when he would become the Scottish, he would become the Isle, Isle Shal Yitzchak, the Isle of the Shoifer, the greatest animal in history. He's been sitting there patiently for 2,000 years waiting for this. So one person looks at this and is, says, wow, this Isle, this exalted Isle, this sanctified Isle, this Scottish Isle, it reached it. And the other person is sitting at home with his wife and they're crying. So we can hear a Maish Shapiro says in the letter, he says, this soul, he says, has been waiting for for who knows how many years, to come down to some family to do its service, and for this family to be the Shimer. So he says, so I, I'm saying these are the two ways we could look at it. We could look at these Down syndrome children, autistic children, as, you know, the, 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 this, the animal activists, or we could look at them as the person who says the Isle of Yitzchak's been waiting there for two thousand. I'm basing this on what Ramosha said. And who knows whose service is greater? The, the Medrash says that um, when Moshe came, this week's Parsha, the last two weeks' Parsha, to build the Mishkan, so it said, Moshe said, I can build the Mishkan v'shachanti b'saycham. So the Medrash says, Mashlamad avadayma. There was an artist who was asked to paint the portrait of the king. Now, to paint the portrait of the king, you're, not, you're talking about an area where a king, it's heads off, heads down. I mean, this was a terrifying thing. So he said to the king, how could I possibly capture your radiance, your beauty, the, your, your royalty in, in, in one painting? So the king said to him, this is what I want. You use your skill set. Use your paints. Use your brushes, your turpentine. Paint the best you can. And you know what? My covet will be in your... I will put myself in, I'll be mitzamta myself into the painting that you did. That's my ratzen. So the Medrash says, the Rabbi Nishalm said to Moshe, it's true, it's impossible. How could you, you know, it's, the Rabbi Nishalm is infinite. The yards, you know, not even mali kalar tzkvayde, but it goes la'ad le'omei alamim, and even that is a bavua de bavua of what kaviyachal is. He says, how could, he said, you're right, but atza besama manecha, you do it the best you can, and you know what? I will make that, I will fit myself in, all of my glory, I'll be a matzamtzim, into the mishkan that you build. But what's the message? We of all, even Moshe Rabbeinu, what is Moshe Rabbeinu next to infinity? What am I or you in, next to infinity? What, next to infinity, does it matter if you're holding a thousand dollars, a million dollars, or a billion dollars, if you have infinite, all the money forever? Next to the numbers of infinity, it's meaningless. It's like pushing a train, you know, you have a 50-yard train carrying coal, so some six-foot-six muscle bouncing says, I'm going to push it, and next to him, a little three-year-old boy starts to push. So the guy says to the three-year-old, what are you pushing? He looks at the six, he says, and you're making any difference. So our, our avoida is really so small, but what does Rabbi Nishalm say? You do yours, and I'll fit my glory into it. We're going to hear from these Rabbanim, both Rabbi Steinberg and Rabbi Benowitz. Many of these children have a consciousness, and they daven, and they they can do mitzvahs with with Osiris and with with great kavana. Who's to say whose service is greater? Do you know that lahalacha? If the Kain Gadol is doing davayda lefnayel lefnim, I knew him kippa. He's bringing in the k'tayrus lefnayel lefnim, 
and a child, one of these children, there would be, there would be, a, he would have to be matzel, the child's choking, and the kain gadol could get the bone out of his throat. He would drop the incense on the floor and run out to save the child. So who knows? Halachically, I'm proving to you, both in 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 uh, in, uh, in the din of Ritzicha and in the din of Sh- and in the kain gadol of style of them Shabbos Yemachal, right? The, the gadol adar the bechal Shabbos that. Who's to say whose light in the, in the light of infinity is the service of such a child smaller than my or your light? So these are my, you know, what I wanted to share with you. You know, last week we had this Shadchan from Eretz Yisrael who spoke about the, you know, the 400,000 shekel bachar, the 600, 800, the million, million two even. And she said when she gets a call and it's a million shekel bachar, she knows it has to be from somebody who has a, some type of a, 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 a yeshiva. Right? Who else could afford it? She said it's either a millionaire or a shiva. And we got a lot of response on that. And here's like some of the voicemails we got. We'll play one or two. Uh, David, I'm first time we talked about last week's show. Uh, two weeks ago, Rafa Baron Opiansky was excellent, really. really um, some great ideas and some great comments and some great explanations about life. Uh, now I want to contrast this to what I heard tonight about Shaduchim Nertis show. I mean, well, this sounds to me like when I give tzedakah to a yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, to a kohel, I'm paying for the person's personal uh, personal expenses uh, and in tune of he's taking hundreds of thousands of dollars of money that was taken to support a kohel or yeshiva, and he's taking it to to personally fund his, his I would call it his family's lifestyle, whatever, you know, even though it's learning, but it's, it's un- unbelievable. It's like, and to think that Rosh Hashivas are in favor of this, and it's uh, it's uh, unbelievable. I started thinking about this 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 lady, this chancellor from Beit Shemesh. I thought she's telling me that that the Rosh Hashivas and Rosh Kolos can afford to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for their children's apartment. Does that mean when I pay my tuition, I'm subsidizing somebody else's apartment when my children don't even have homes of their own? Just a thought. Thank you. So what I want to say, I just want to respond. First of all, I don't know what's true. It's not true. Do your own investigation and just mire it. But what is next week's parsha? Ela pikude hamishkan. So what does the med- med- medrash say? That Moshe had to give an accounting at the end, right? What did they say? They said, Moshe, where's the money? Show us, give us an accounting of the money, right? Which is quite amazing when you think of it, right? What do we know about Moshe? We know about Moshe. Who, which person of the, all of creation was the greatest integrity? What does it say about the Chol Beisi Nemanhu? There is nobody in history with great, who says on it, the Chol Beisi Nemanhu. He's the most trustworthy. And not only that, you could say maybe the Rabbi Nishon trusted him. Maybe people didn't trust him. What does it say? The Gam Becha Yaminu Le'olam. He's the only person in history. The Gam Becha Yaminu Le'olam. And what does it say about Moshe? Moshe had to give an accounting. They said, Moshe, we want transparency. We want respect. We gave money. People get up early in the morning. They work their hardest for their money. He says, it's our lifeblood. We want transparency. What happened to the money? So you would think, what should the Torah say? Shake it! Arise! Varfam arise! How do you question somebody who's begun? And what does the Torah say? No. Now, is it just a medrash? So it's halacha in 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 Hilchas Tzadok in Reish and Zion that kedei she unikim Hashem veYisrael the Rama says toiv liten cheshben. And where does the Gaon bring the Makayer? The Gaon brings the Makayer from next week's parsha. Elopikudei amishkan. So is it a bad thing to ask Rashi? Listen, I know you know you raised money. Can we see an accounting? Where does the money go from? I mean, did you pay for a million shekel bacher? And you're going to say. David is a Shegit. I'm just, I'm quoting a Shulchan Aruch. I'm quoting a, 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 a Ramah. I'm quoting a Goyen. And I'm quoting a Medrash. I'm, it says it about Moshe. And what it's, it's about transparency and respect about the system. There should be, you know, somebody gives something so important to them, they have a right to an accounting. So what do I say? I, say, I don't know if it's true or not, but you certainly have the right to ask the question. Let me ask the riddle of the week. So it says that Klal Yisrael brought Chelas to the Mishkan. Right? 
So the question is, in Menachis, what does it say? The Gemara Membeza Membez, that you need, you have to be Tzveya the Tcheles for the Tzemer HaMishkan, Lishma, that had to be Tzveya L'Shem HaMishkan, right? You know, just like Tcheles and Tzitzis, you have to make Vutchil L'Shem Tzitzis, right? The same thing, and, and where do you learn that from? Because it says Klil Tcheles by Big Day Kahuna, and the Gemara is Makish, Tzitzis Big Day Kahuna, so you see, Big Day Kahuna need Lushma, just like Tzitzis. In fact, we learned Tzitzis out of Big Day Kahuna. So how could they be Makabal from Klal Yisrael? The Tcheles that they had, it's Chaser in the Din Lushma. Somebody had a, a stack of Tcheles in the house, they brought it. What do you mean? It had to be done, Lushem Mishkan. That's our riddle of the week. So now let's go to our wonderful guest. We have the honor of having with us on the phone from Eretz Yisrael, Harab Avram Steinberg, he is the Mechaber of the Encyclopedia for, uh, for Rafua, right? He's, yeah. the, uh, he's also the Director of Medical Ethics at Shari Tzedek in Yerushalayim. He is Chairman of the Israeli National Council on Bioethics. He won the Israeli Prize for the, his seven-volume Encyclopedia Hilchas Rafuas in Hebrew the most comprehensive textbook ever compiled on Hilchus Rafua, which is, by the way, translated into English. He's a director of the Torah publishing group Yad Harav Herzog, and I believe we were very mekurv with Hagoyin Rav Shleim Is that correct? Right. Yeah. It's, a ver- it's an honor to have you with us, Rabbi Steinberg. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so this week's program is about Down syndrome, and, you know, sort of, but also about other, you know, childhood diseases, you know, other type of diseases like this. So we would like to start with the question, testing for Down syndrome and the possibility of abortion. Could you tell me, um, Ruff Steinberg, how you address these two topics? Okay, so they are actually interrelated. If there is a, a, a permission to abort once you find out that it's a Down syndrome, then you're allowed to test for it. If you're not allowed to abort, there's no point in testing it because anyway, nothing can be done. And actually, that is a very detailed machloikes, uh, primarily between the Tzitz Eliezer, Rav Waldenberg, and Rav Moshe Feinstein. Uh, they uh, exchange actually uh, w- went through me when I was still a very young uh, physician. I posed the Shaila to a Waldenberg, who was uh, the Rob of Sharet Tzedek in the old building. He lived across the street on Jaffa Road, whoever knows where yeah, he, he was. was. He, was my, he was my first cousin. I visited him oh. many, to- many times. I think he lived on Rehov Mazor. Right, Rehov Mazor A, which yeah. was just across the street of the hospital, and the shul of the hospital actually was the shul that he davened. Yeah. So when we had any shyless, and in those days, uh, there were very few form physicians, very few abonim who knew uh, about the more modern issues in medicine, and it was really a treat for us to be able to approach him, and he was always very approachable and, and answered all our shyness. So there was a case of a tay Sachs pregnancy, and actually in those days it was the beginning that we could test the situation of the fetus. All the sugyas in Shas and Rishonim dealing with abortion had to do with maternal indication, such as uh, the mother is in danger if she continues the pregnancy or she was raped or any other uh, maternal issues. No one knew how the fetus looks. So there, was no, there were no shyness about what do you do if the fetus is uh, disabled one way or the other. So that was relatively new with ultrasound and with genetic testings that we now know how to assess the fetus before he is born. So that was one of the first cases with tay Sachs, which is a very terrible disease. And uh, I, we posed it to him, and he wrote an extensive tshuva saying that it is allowed to abort a tay Sachs uh, fetus because uh, the issue, the raisa of abortion, according to his uh, lamdish, 
is Echal only on non-Jews, because the Isur comes from a posuk to Bnei Noach. Shofech dam ha'adam ba'adam damo yishafech, says the Gemara in Sanhedrin, Ezu adam ba'adam ze ubar b'mei imo, so that if you kill not only an adult, but also an uber within his mother, you are liable to get uh, capital punishment. But since this posuk is listed only to Bnei Noach before Matan Torah, and wasn't repeated after Matan Torah, the rule is that in this case it applies only to Goy. However, there's another rule that says, Leka mide de Ben Noach osur v'Yisroel mutar. It doesn't make sense that a Benoyach who is mechuy of only seven mitzvahs, he will be stricter, and the issue on him will be bigger than the issue of a Jew who has to keep Tariag mitzvahs and many more on top of it. So therefore, and you have in it, Sanhedrin, yeah? Right. So therefore, it is also applied to a Jew. But says Rabbi Waldberg, and he brings a whole host of poskim, that this rule of Leka Mide is only the Rabbonon. So indeed, Mide Raisa, only a Goy is also Midoraisa to do an abortion. But a Jew who performs the abortion is over only on Isu de Rabbonon. And since such defective uh, babies that will be born cause a lot of tsar, so the rule is Bemkom Tsar loy goes to Rabbonon. So therefore he allowed it. He allowed also Down syndrome, he allowed many other significant uh, <coughs> diseases of the fetus. However, Moshe was very sharp against this psak and he really wrote very, uh, a very sharp language. that Charolay Mara, I think he wrote. Yeah. Right. And uh, therefore, he, he held that it's an isu de oraisa of retzicha, even by a Jew. The only difference between a Jew and a non-Jew is that a non-Jew will be high of Misa, and a Jew will not be high of Misa. But an isu de oraisa of retzicha, he is over. So therefore, he says, how can you kill me, de oraisa, someone who can live? Although he will live in, in disabled fashion, but imagine when he is born and you see how he looks, will you kill him? So since you're not allowed to kill him after, you're not allowed to kill him before. Now, I think that most poskim hold somewhere in between, which is they disagree with Rabbi Waldenberg that that's only an Isod Rabbonon, but many of them disagree with Rabbi Moshe that it's an Isod Rais of Ritzicha. They don't think that this applies to Jew. They find all kinds of other isurim, but it's still the Raisa. So therefore, sometimes when the situation is so uh, disastrous that the mother uh, becomes very upset and, and maybe on the verge of a mental uh, breakdown, Shlomo Zalman sometimes allowed the abortion not because of the fetus, but because of the mother. So... Most poskim hold that you cannot abort a, a Down syndrome. Moreover, as opposed to Tay Sachs, where 100% of Tay Sachs will be the same. They have the same destiny. They will, after half a year, become to deteriorate, have seizures, uh, cerebral palsy, blindness, and within three to five years, all of them die. Whereas with Down syndrome, the fact that we know that this fetus is a Down syndrome doesn't tell us anything what level of function will he have once he will be born. He can be a very high functional Down syndrome and a very low functional uh, Down syndrome. And some of them function quite well, and they get even married, and they, they have uh, jobs, and they can live a regular life. So that <laughs> adds to the fact that even if it's an isodorizer, it's hard to say a priori that it will be a devastating situation. And therefore, most poskim today do not allow aborting a Down syndrome, and hence there's no point to test for Down syndrome because what would you do with it? Right. Now, even though you know Ramosha wrote that the Chuvas Hamarik was Mizuyif, right, and and subsequently they found that you know the Ber Sheva, who was the Talmud of the Marik, right. quotes it in the name of the Marik, is involved right. the Knesset Hagdola, so. Uh, how do those how do those rabbanim respond to the fact that they've discovered post fact that many you know in, in his immediate you know right who lived right after him quoted him as well and and, and he was moderate. Yeah, so so uh, those poskim who hold it's an issue the Raisa are not uh, dependent only on the Marit. There are other poskim 
that you can derive from them that the Isu is an Isu de Raisa. Oh, yeah, the, the Rambam, the, the, yeah. Right. The Marit spoke about it very clearly. So if it's yeah. so clear, the yeah. Moshe said it's Mezuyaf. But even if we take away the Mezuyaf, the uh, Moshe says another Mezuyaf there, which is interesting. He had his uh, his uh, mind on the Isu, on the Chumra of the Isu. There is a Toys first, one Toys first in Nida that says, Mutar laharog ubar b'meimoy. Yeah, yeah. Says the Moshe, it's a tor soifer. Yeah, Can't be yeah, that they say yeah. mutar. It has to say also. Yes, two zuyafim. Yeah, it's yeah, a little yeah, difficult yeah, to, yeah, to follow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, Rabbi Steinberg, making a hatoyva native when a child is born, or making a shechianu, a br- it's a boy or a girl, a bris pidyon aben, making a bris on Shabbos. How do you? What do we makabel from the paiskim on these shilas? Let's start with Hatoyva right. Meitav or a Shechianu. Somebody has a yeah. Down syndrome that's bought child. Do they make a, 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 a Shechianu or a Pidyan or a Hatoyva Meitav? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. A, a Down syndrome, as I said, when he's a baby, we don't know how he will be. He may be a, a, great, a, a great asset to the family. I know families that are very happy with their Down syndrome. They are happy children, usually. They are easy to raise. They, some of them, I mean, they look so different, and everyone knows how a Down syndrome looks, that they get this stigma <coughs> that they are certainly uh, unable to do anything. It's true that some of them have a very low function, but many of them function quite right. According to Shlomo Zalman, if he understands somewhat of uh, who is the Kodesh Baruch Hu and what broches you make and for whom you make the broches, you can make a bar mitzvah, he can, go, he can get an aliyah, make the broches, he can be moitzi, uh, everyone agrees that they they are human beings. It's not well. Just there's no da- there's no doubt, Rabbi Starmbeck, that there's a human being. But making a shechianu needs a simcha, right? So the right. question is: is there is there a simcha when the child is born? So I'm saying that a child born, obviously the parents uh, at the first minute look at it uh, as a disaster. But when we talk to them, there were times where especially in the Haredi community, they abandoned the child. The Poskim told them, you're not allowed to abort. The child was born, and then they told them, better not get uh, bonding with him and just abandon him in the hospital, and they'll take him to some facility, and that's how he will grow, and you won't be attached to him, which I think is a significant mistake, because these children, if they get a good rearing and a good lo- and, and a loving family and, and people uh, promote them and they go to special ed schools and they learn, they can be a source of happiness. It's not necessarily that they are so devastated. That's not true in, mo- in many cases, not in all, but in many cases. So a priori, when the baby just was born, you don't know what kind of baby he will be, and therefore he is like any other baby that you make the, the same process. Now, let's say the mother would need an operation to save the fetus's life. Right. What's the medical, so op- the the medical obligation towards a, towards a Down syndrome child? Right. So here there's a machloikis between Shlomo Zalman and Rabbi Yashim. Shlomo Zalman says that if the child will not be healthy, there is no chiyuv on the mother to add a risk by delivering in a C-section. Right. So she can deliver regularly, and if the child uh, will be damaged, will be damaged. Obviously, we should uh, explain to her that it's important and it, it may do better to the child, but she's not mechuyev. Abel Yashir disagreed, and he said that if it's a reasonable situation, if it's not a lethal disease, such as tay Sachs or, or similar conditions, they both agree that there's no chiyuf to add risk. But according to Avli Yashiv, the added risk today with modern medicine of C-section is minimal. So therefore, uh, he said that uh, she's mechuyev to undergo a C-section in order to better the condition of the child. So here, here's the question, Rabbi Steinberg. The, 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 the mechaba, I think it's an, excuse me, maybe tafchav dalad, paskin, that uh, somebody does not have to undergo pain to be matzel, let's say, sakonas ever, to be matzel somebody else. So somebody says, I'm going to shoot uh, Ruvain, unless you agree I should cut your finger off. 
the uh, I believe it's the smile over there says we don't pass it like you shall me and you don't need to undergo you don't have to lose your pinky so that Ruvain should live. Why would a mother have to undergo a C section? She should say, Listen, I don't have that obligation. It's we it's it's as equally dangerous as let's say loss of a pinky. It's Sakana Saver and therefore since this child it, I, I just don't want to do it. How would how would Rebel Yashiv respond to that? So it, it is not exactly the way you, you presented it. It's a tube of the Radvaz, and the Radvaz talks about the situation where a ruler comes to a Jew and says, I'm going to kill your neighbor Jew unless you allow me to cut off your limb. Says the Radvaz that he is even also to do it because that will kill him. Yeah. Yeah, it's a... a, a, a and this, I believe the right. SMA brings it in the beginning of Tafcha yeah, Dalet, right, right, right? Right, right. But the, the source is the Radvas. Now, the Radvas... And the Yerushalmi Ursha, argues on the yeah, Radvas. Right. The Yerushalmi holds that uh, in the suffix corner, you have to put yourself in your own suffix corner to save someone else from Vada's corner. Right. But according to the Bavli, although it's not written specifically, it's just uh, you can learn from the Bavli that the, the Bavli did not agree with it. You don't have to put yourself in a Sophic's corner even to save someone from a Vada corner. But says the Radvas that if the corner to save someone else is minimal, then you are Mechuyev. That's a Loi Tamod al Dam Recho. You are yeah, Mechuyev to do it. Rabbi Steinberg, so if, here, somebody came to you, Rabbi Steinberg, if somebody came to you and they said, we're going to amputate your hand, we're going to do it in Shari Tzedek. It's, it's, it's not at all dangerous, right? We're going to have the top surgeon. We'll have Rabbi Steinberg there when, while this happens so that Ruvain could live. Would you have a, an obligation to do it? Uh, that's an interesting uh, Shaila because according to the Adva, the problem with the truth of the Advaz is that he puts three levels. There's a level when there's a chiyuf of loy tamad al dam reich or the and that is when there's no scanner to the one who is going to rescue someone else. Then it's a chiyuv de raisa. Then he says there is a minimal risk, and then it's not a chiyuv de raisa, but it's midas chsidis. When when it becomes a significant uh, risk, then it's chsidis shil shtus, and, and you're not allowed to do it. The problem with, with this tshuva is that he doesn't give numbers. How much is it a, min- a minor scanner? How much is it a significant scanner? When is it no scanner? And, and by the way, the Gemara in Sanhedrin that uh, deals with the Loi Tamad al Dam Recho brings three examples when there is a chiyuv of Loi Tamad al Dam Recho. When you see someone drowning, you have to jump into the river and take this person out. When you see a beast running after a person, you have to run after the beast and kill the beast in order to save this patient. And when you see Listim running, you have to save him. These are examples of scorned. You can't say that there is not even a minimal risk. Even if I know how to swim, if someone is drowning, I'm putting myself in a certain risk. So the idea is that it's a minimal risk. And therefore, the Gemara says there is a loitamot. By the way, according to Avadi Yosef, to donate a kidney from a live donor when he is healthy and he remains with one kidney is a chiyuf of loy tamod al dam recho because nowadays this procedure is very simple and there are hardly any death uh, situations and there are hardly any complications although today we think that in, in later years there might be some complications and he held it's a loy tamod al dam recho there is a risk but it's very minimal but but you so would agree that thinking, Rabbi 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 Shlame, you would agree that many Paiskim don't agree with that, which is why right. they, we don't. So 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 assuming that. No, no. Red- what I want to say is that how do you judge what is a minimal risk? Even nowadays, it is a risk that is more than a minimal risk. But a C-section would fall into the category that it's a minimal risk. Let's say, that is let's, say you, to let's say losing an, let's say losing a hand is not a minimal risk. You you have the fabulous doctor. He says it's absolutely not a minimal risk. Would you say right. yes or no? Well, if, if the situation is that there's no risk, then there's loy tamod al dam If you can save someone life and you do something that for you. It's almost no risk. Yes, then you have to do it. I, I, but the, the other How argument, the other argument is, listen, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Steinberg, the a kidney 
is is I think it's one in many thousands that there's a risk, right? Good. It's uh, right, and and we have a chuvis marsheshach and many others that say when something falls below a thousand, it's right. it's not even called the miyach ene matzi, and yet right. I think the majority of poskim would say that somebody doesn't have to give a kidney today. Right. Also, so that, so, that so, follows so, uh, that follows our Wallenberg's position that says that lo tamod al dam reicho has to do only with your tircha, with your... Right, 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 set. exactly. But now... Uh, Igure, Igure Igure Mager, like the Gemara and Sanhedrin. So I'm saying, right. so based on that position, which I think most Paiskin would agree with, the woman should be able to say, I don't want to undergo a C-section, because right. it's an operation. And I, I, right. so, so my that question is... Right, so that is Shalman Zaman's position. That is Shalman Zaman's position, clearly. He okay. said that even if there's a minimal risk added to the procedure... Once there is minimal risk, and the woman doesn't want even for a healthy child, right? You can't you can't force her. And Avil Yashif said, no, the the risk is so minimal that it's not different now, than jumping into the river and saving someone from drowning. Now, Rabbi Yashif also adds another reason. He says because a woman is meshubed labayla to have children, right? And he makes that like an ikker. He says there's a sheba the isha lahele jiladim labayla. Even though there's a there's a there's a danger to that, so so Abazai, so she has no right to be mavata, and I I don't understand that position for two reasons. First of all, okay, so she says you know I'm a shubid labayli, so I I also have to turn down his bed, and I don't want to do it, so I'm not such a good right. wife. So that that's right. a chayshim mishpat shaila or an evaneza shaila, not a not a yeridei and right. and additionally. Um, let's say the husband says, look, I also don't want the down. Uh, the, 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 I'm, I'm asking, I'm not going to be oimid on my schus. Well, if that's right. Rabbi Yashiv's main taina, the husband should be able to. And on the issue would be a taina. So his, his, would you agree that his tshuva is difficult to understand? Right. No, I, I, I follow Rabbi Zalman. I just tried to explain where Rabbi Yashiv comes from. But Rabbi Zalman certainly said the way you presented. That was his position very clearly. And in fact, we, I don't recall one case that we forced the woman to undergo a C-section for Down syndrome or for, for any other disabled child. A T-sex child. Now, what about giving up for adoption? But I know that if we're talking yeah. about it, one minute, just if we're talking about it, we do sometimes uh, try to enforce the mother, although legally we can't do it, when, for instance, it's a healthy baby that becomes asphyxiated, that there is trouble in him getting out. And if we will do a C-section, he'll be a healthy child. If we leave it the way it is, and he will be born uh, in the regular way, he will be severely damaged. So it's the difference between being healthy wow. or damaged. Wow. And here, if the woman says, I don't want, that, I think, is something that halachically we should impose on her because she's causing a significant damage to the fetus, whereas for her, it's a minimal damage. Now, sometimes, I'll tell you a story just uh, not long ago. We had a, a Hasidic woman that uh, the baby started to have signs of being uh, asphyxiated, and the sooner you take him out, the better the outcome is. And we told her we need not right now to do a C-section. So she said she can't agree until she asked the Rebbe. Oh, my. And the Rebbe happened to be in the mikveh. Oh, and my. they couldn't reach him. Oh, my. So what do you do in such a case? You tell them that the Rebbe said yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm saying that things are sometimes more complicated than the clear black and white uh, So situation. what did you do? What, what did you do? No, we, we, we told her, you must agree. We don't have time. We'll get you the Rebbe to give you a broche later, and now we'll do it. And oh, finally my. she agreed, but by law we can't force her. By a law wow. we can force her, but not by law. So it's Rabbi Starmer, a giving up for, it be. Rabbi Starmer, giving up for adoption, and I, I know it's not really a medical question, but it's sort of, it has to do with mental health and certainly the mental health of the child. What was, what was the position, your position, the position of the Gedolim, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman, et cetera, who you spoke to, keeping the child or giving it up for adoption? Well, so it depends what child you're talking about. I assume you're talking about a disabled child. I'm talking about, oh, let's say, a, da a Down syndrome child. Right, a Down syndrome child. So we today encourage parents to keep the child because there will be no one who will take better care of him than his natural parents. There are good uh, people who can take care of such a child, 
but usually there are people that have their own children and it's an additional child and he's different. It won't be the same as parents. And for the child's health, it's very important. It also, in the long run, it is very educational to the family to see that there is Rachmonis, that you can't care of such a child. They learn how to have good midas. They learn how to have chesed. There are a lot of advantages to keep the child. We can't force uh, people not to give him for adoption, but if they ask what is the best from a medical halachic point of view, it is to keep the child. Unless, obviously, the parents are so devastated and so ashamed and it will shut to the shidduchim of others and all kinds of uh, things that we, that we encounter uh, which not always are the right way to deal with things, but we can't force it. But right. I think if... If they give us the odds, what is the best to do? The best is a down child to keep at home. Rabbi, Rabbi Starmick, how many down children have you dealt with over the course as a, as a physician? Oh, many, many. Like many as in a, do, a dozen, 50, 25, what would no, you say? No, in the hundreds. So, so your expertise is from real hands-on Shemush. So right. let's say you have one of the cases where a family, for whatever the reason is, says we absolutely can't do it. And, there, and, and by the way, there are a number of Hasidic Rebbes. The Skver Rebbe in America is adamantly opposed to the, the parents taking the child home. What's right. the, uh, so I'm saying that in Israel there was a period where Hasidic Haredi families were advised to abandon the child. The, the baby right. was born. They told them, go home, leave him at the hospital, don't get connected with him, don't have any bonding with him, and the hospital will take care of the child. But, that's, but, but you say for the most part that's changed. For the most part you say that's changed. Yeah, for the most part, we don't see any abundant uh, Down syndrome in Israel at least. We don't see yeah. it anymore. So here's my question. Giving it to, let's say, you know, it's hard to take on a, an ill child, a Tay-Sex child, and a non-Jewish family wants to adopt. So... What well, that's, been, the famous, that's the famous Tom Tom of Tom Seifer. Right. right, so how do they enact it today? Walk me through it. How do, did so the Pais Tim accept the Tom Seifer? Yeah. According to you have to do all efforts possible to give him either to a family or to an institution that will keep kashos, that will take care of the child in a Jewish way, and not give him, not only to a non-Jewish, but even to a Jewish institution or parents who are not sure mitzvahs. It's almost the same. Well, but, but uh, if I'm correct, Rabbi Shlom, Rabbi Shlom is Alman's position, as he says, because many of these children are mechuyiv in mitzvahs because they have consciousness, they have uh, understanding, they may not have, you know, tr understanding like, you know, p p on a great level, but enough so that they're mechuyiv be mitzvahs. Is that correct? Right. Right. So let's say you have a child that is not mechuyiv be mitzvahs. You have a child that they don't have that level of understanding. Right. And I've, and I've seen those children that they, right. that they, um, what, what, how do you how 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 do they deal so with even that? Even then, even then, to be machel treifus to to a Jewish child, uh, even if he doesn't have the the cognition to understand the difference between uh, something that is kosher and, and non kosher, still, according to the Chassam Soifer, even in such cases, you have to make an effort to get him to a place where at least they will feed him uh, a bekasher. Even though the, the neshama, the, the, there are parts that we don't know enough to know that that is wrong to do for a Jewish uh, person. However, if you can't find any other situation, but David, it's mutar. So the woman <coughs> said, you can do it, but even if you did it, try co to continue to look for places where you can uh, switch him to a place where he will be uh, taken care in the right way. So even though there is a tshuva from Reb Maisha, which which I think that if 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 the person is potim in a mitzvah, right, the argument would be made there's no chiv to be meichel them kashrus if they're potim in a mitzvah, and Reb Maisha writes that if somebody is certainly potim in a mitzvah, he writes in um, in in uh, Amatayra, he writes it's better to keep them, but otherwise you can give them to uh, uh, an institution, an American secular institution, a government institution, but clearly that's not the, the desired result if possible. Would you, do you right. agree with that? Right, yeah, right. Now, Absolutely. by the way, this could, we, we think of it only by, uh, um, by Down syndrome, but you could also have the same Shiloh when you have elderly parents who, right. become, who suffer from dementia, 
Absolutely. Could they be put in a nursing home where there's no kasha, the kashras? Because at this point, since they're put them in a mitzvah, there's no chiv of kashras. Is that a right. similar shiloh, would you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a similar shiloh. Yeah. So lechabchila, you shouldn't do it. But if there's no other way. But nowadays, it used to be so. In the days of the Chassam Soifer, there were no Jewish institutions for such uh, people, either elderly or, or, or uh, children. So that was a real shiloh. Today... I, maybe in America it is still a shiloh, but in Israel there are enough places that you can put such people, either uh, demented people or uh, children with mental retardation, in places that will be kept uh, kashos and, and, and be dealt with in the right way. So here's my next question. Um, let's say you have an adopted mother, and there are Nashim Tzidkaniyes, who will adopt a child like this when the family doesn't want it, if those occasions happen. Can the mother kiss a Down syndrome of a child? Can a father kiss a Down syndrome little girl? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the issues of Yichud with, uh, with uh, children that are adopted, not the Down, the regular children, is, is a major shyly. Right, but uh, I'm not I'm not a mumche in that. That's not my real uh, field. Uh, I have to look into it. But but obviously it's a shyler because it's not their child. So if it's a boy and the mother or a girl and the father, you there, there is an issue of yichud with them. I mean there are there is a, there is a lashon on medrash that an adopted father and adopted mother is the real father and the real mother. Right. And, uh, but there's some some other medrashim too in in Bishalach, whatever. But okay, let's right. so let's move on to another. Area. Have you seen Down children get married to each other? Yes, yes. In fact, just uh, while we are talking, uh, last week a book was published by uh, edited by Rafi Feuerstein. Do you hear the, the name of Feuerstein, Professor Feuerstein? No, my Dr. apologies. Professor Feuerstein uh, invented an educational system primarily for Down syndrome, but it applies to many others who are cognitively below below average. So it's a whole institution for such children. And uh, his son, Rafi Feuerstein, who is a rabbi in Harnoff, has a Down syndrome child himself. And they promote very much that they should get married if they are at a level that they understand what it is. And in fact, his son got married. And based on that, he published a whole book related to the question when and how and who should take care of it uh, if it gets to a marriage situation, what, what should you do? And he very much encourages it if the, the cognitive level is sufficient. What you, and fact, what about having nowadays, children? Do you believe they should yeah, have children? I mean, yeah, so usually many of them are infertile, so they need IVF. And if they do IVF, we can do, to do today PGD, which is to select fertilized eggs not... that don't carry the gene or the right. chromosomal so, abnormality. So, so in my fact, question we have to... now a couple at Charit yeah. yeah. He is a Down syndrome. She is not very well mentally. That was a shidduch done. And we are look and, and they want to have ch they are married and they want to have children. The only way for them to have children is do IVF, but they may transmit to the next generation the defective uh, chromosome. So the question is, should we help them with IVF and PGD? And the major question here for us, at least, is, will they be able to raise a normal child? And therefore, our approach is that we do a psychological evaluation. We see if they work somewhere, and we get reports from the workplace. And they must have a support system, either by parents or by other relatives that live close by, and they commit themselves that they will help them to raise the child. Wow. And there are more and more such cases now. Wow. Rabbi Steinberg, my uh, kola kavo to you. I, across, the, across the ocean, I take off my hat to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Now, here's a, a, you know, Down syndrome. There are many families that have Down syndrome children. Somebody comes to be Meshadach, and they say, um, you know, Ruvain, I don't know why I pick him. He's first to the Shvatim. He's the unlucky one. Yes. I say, Ruvain has a Down syndrome child, and he has a most wonderful daughter. So we want to be Meshadach. We want to know, is it, is it 
is this does this get transmitted? Is there a higher likelihood that our our son will then have a Down syndrome child? And they call you up. How do you respond? Well, so nowadays it's quite easy because it depends when the Down sibling was born. If he was born at the mother's age over 40, then it's not genetic. Then it's because of the age of the mother, and we don't need to do anything, and for sure the other siblings who are not Down will not carry the Down, uh, uh, the down uh, chromosomal abnormality. However, if the mother was young having a Down child, then in, most, in many instances it's a translocation. It's called a translocation, which means that the mother, the carrier, is healthy, but her genomic makeup is not healthy, and therefore it can come out for the next generation in the right mixture to become a down. So that is transmittable. So, so what how would you I respond? recommend in this case, yeah, so what I tell this case is, A, what is the age of the mother that has the down sibling? And if it's a young mother, or if in the family, in the extended family, there are other cases of down syndrome, let's say the the aunt has a Down syndrome child and, and, uh, and a sister-in-law and so on. If, if, if it's a part of a family, then it's very simple to test the boy, if that was the case, that he is the healthy uh, Meshudach, to test him for translocation. It's a simple test, and it's 100% proof. You mean so the boy or the girl, the, the, the sibling, you test the sibling. Right. And if right. the sibling the is healthy... The one to make the Shidduch, right. you test whether he has a translocation. If he doesn't have, then the fact that he has a sibling that is a Down syndrome even at the young age of the mother is not relevant. He is clean. Right. Now And that's the, easy today. Now let's say they find they test and they find that it's positive that he has the translocation. What do you recommend right. then? So then it depends. Uh, we have today a solution that I, I mentioned earlier called P G D. Yeah, PGD we, we, we've for done for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So if the other side is willing to get into the shidduch, let's say it's an outstanding boy or girl, and for, many, for any other reason they would make the shidduch, they can know that if they want to be sure that the offspring uh, will be healthy, they will have children by PGD. But wow. that is not a simple decision. I mean... No. Uh, it's a different lifestyle. You have to live on contraceptives before you right. decide to have a child, and so on. Right. So let me let me. Um, wow, that's that's fascinating. Yeah, Rabbi Rabbi Steinberg, the age of the mother. There's recently been a study that the age of the father is even is far more dangerous than the age of the mother. Right, but not for Down necessarily. I, I saw we, we're having we're having on actually a, a, a physician from the University of California, I think, today. Who, there was a recently published paper that if the father is over 45, the 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 instance of Down goes up by 600 percent, which I think yeah. is amazing. Yeah. That and the also father. Other diseases, the other diseases. So, so my question to you is, Rabbi Starbing, my question to you is, if somebody was Makayim Pruravu, you have a family, they have seven children. The mother is 40, the father is 42, 43, 44. Would you, would you recommend they continue Be'erev al Yadecha, or is the instances of disease when the mother is post-40 and the father is post-40, 44, 45, so great that you would suggest uh, not like that? Well, when you say so great, it's actually not so great. Uh, That's my question. Uh, how, how great is no, it? I'm saying, so 37 to 40 years of age of the mother makes the chance to have a Down syndrome 1%. 1% okay. is not zero, no. but it's only 1%. Right. So if the mother wants to take a chance and have another child at that age, so she's taking a risk of 1%. But now, Rabbi Steinberg, many let me, people let me just, do it. But, what about the father? But, what about, but add on to that, the father. The for the father. Let's say that if the father has a, a translocation, the, the chances will be 6%. So it's still... Only quote unquote six percent of no, but it's a hundred. But it's six plus one is seven. Right. So I'm okay. saying. So so they have to know that this is what it can be. However, we encourage such couples who want to have more children. We don't encourage them to have more children, but if they want to do PGD, and then they are sure that they'll yeah, have. Yeah, but PG, a, Rabbi, Rabbi Steinberg, how much does in America? I think PGD is 
it's tens of thousands of dollars, no? Okay, that's if they want to have a healthy child. By the way, they can come to Israel and they'll pay very little. Here it's very cheap. Very interesting. So, so Rabbi Stein, even if you travel, if you, even if you pay for the travel and for the hotel, still you'll come out much cheaper than in the United that's, States. That's a very important message. I'm going to lead with that message. Uh, how much does it cost in Israel to do PGD? I can't give you a figure. For Israeli citizens, you for can For an American, PGD. give us a, a guesstimate. This I don't know, but for Israeli citizens, you can do PGD for two children, no matter how many cycles you have to do until you get two healthy children. It's but so if you, could you give us a guess if an American wanted to go there to do PGD, what it would be, a uh, low I, or a high? I have a guess because I'm not in this uh, okay. area. Okay. I know so, so, that it's much, much cheaper. So let me go that, back to that. Rabbi Stein, I guess, so if, if a woman is over 40 and her husband is 40 plus, would you recommend that they not have children except via PGD? Well, I think that even by PGD I wouldn't recommend. I think enough is enough. Why take risks? There's no chiyuv to take risks. There is lo erev, lo tanach yadcho, a little more uh, than, than the purvu and then lasheves, but not uh, so many. I'll tell you a, a funny story. Not funny, but an interesting story. We get a, a charitzedek a request for PGD for women who are 40, 45 years old who have 12, 13 children, and they want another child, but they want to make PGD. And when I ask some of them, you have 12 children. Why, why, why do you need this trouble? PGD is a, a complicated situation. So they say, because my neighbor has 18 children, so how can I come to the playground with 12 children? I don't know if it's a joke or not, but we get these uh, answers from time to time, and I think that it's not right to put them into the uh, – it's a minor risk, but still there is a risk of IVF with, with the hormones and so on uh, for having so many children after the time. I don't see any reason logically to do it. Well, Rabbi Stami, it's been a, a great honor to have you on with us, and Rabbi Shalom should give you kayak to keep publishing your fabulous, your fabulous farm. Thank you. Uh, just for the public uh, knowledge, I recently published a new set of books called, it's in Hebrew, Arufuaka Lacha, which is six volumes, and it's not done like the encyclopedia. Encyclopedia goes alphabetically according to the title and covers everything that anyone ever said er anything on this topic, like an encyclopedia. This is done uh, in more halachic approach, so that there are halachas, and then there are the sources for the halachas and uh, discussion wherever it warrants. And it goes from before the human being is created, egg donation, surrogacy, uh, sperm donation, and so on, until after a person dies, which is organ transplants, uh, autopsies, and, and so on. So it really covers the entire human life cycle halachically. So that oh. is a different style of, uh, and there are a lot of additions to the uh, encyclopedia that I wrote earlier because every day there's something new. A new, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Rabbi Steinberg. A big thank honor you. to have you. Call thank to. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Call to. We have the honor of having with us on the phone from Brooklyn, New York, Rabbi Baruch Rabinowitz, a machanach for 37 years in our Torah, in Teferis Torah, Teres Yaakov, Menal of Tarvadas. He's a Talmud of a base had Talmud, a Dave Schwartzman, a Ramesh Shapiro. He was a Talmud of the Miri Yeshiva. He's also the parent of a child with Down syndrome. And in that capacity, he got a letter from Ramesh Shapiro as a Talmud that from Shmuel Kamenes, he said it could have been written by a Rishin. And it's the Torah Shabiksav, I'm sorry, the Torah Shabalpeh of, uh, of dealing with children. Uh, with these type of disabilities. The Blue Jiva Rebbe also was in awe of the letter. Welcome, Rabbi Rabinowitz. Good morning, good morning. So, Rabbi Baruch, keeping a child with Down syndrome, what was the, what, what, in, I mean, I, I want to say that I talk about this very hesitantly. You know, it says when, when Moshe was by the Sne, it says, Salna lecha me'al raglecha, when you see a burning bush, which the Medrash on the place says refers to Klal Yisrael in pain, you have to speak with great humbleness and deference. So I approach this topic with great anivas and without, you know, with great tremendous respect for those who are Isaac in it. So 
given the above, what is what did the Gedolim say about keeping a child with Down syndrome, keeping it at home or sending it to an institution? Well, for the most part, Yeroi Gedolim Yisrael, even going back generations, um, encouraged people, when possible, to take home their own child and raise the child in their home environment. And um, in reality, let's say, for the issue of Down syndrome per se, most of the children, the huge, vast majority, will end up to be Bar Chiyuva and Mitzvahs, obligated to do Torah and Mitzvahs to whatever level they can. There'll be Bar Chiyuva and all of Torah. There may be an onus on some of it, but therefore we have a regular Chiyuv to bring them up in our homes and educate them and be Mechanach them like we would any other child. Um, going back, you know, the issue wasn't as strong, let's say, uh, 100 years ago because most of the children didn't make it to adulthood. Most of the children died when they were young. And that may have been the source in Europe, yet with some people would give away to institutions because most children died from infections or heart issues. Most children that with Down syndrome are 50% born with some heart issue, 25% require surgery. All of this wasn't possible that many years ago. And it could be then that you know those were the, the shtots now were the children who had the developmental disabilities. But certainly in the um, into, ensuing years, and even even before that, even in Europe in the war years, the Satmar Rebbe of Yoel, Zechetzad of Kodesh Levrocha, encouraged people to take the children home. There's a story in the uh, in the book written, I think it's called My Special Brother, um, about the, that somebody wanted to give to an institution, and the Rebbe told them, if you give away the child, you could be giving away the entire bracha from your house when you give away this child. Um, the dilemma of today, in the literature world for sure, uh, overwhelmingly encourage people to take home the children and raise the children. It's a difficult challenge. The the shock and and the disappointment, um, the adjustments that need to be made upon birth are are, are major. And uh, very often there are people that become very confused and they're filled with pain and they run to get piski halacha from people when they're in the matzah of pain. But for the most part, people are encouraging to take home the children. To, it's a, in a soyan, or as my Rebbe said, zeloni sayon zet tafkid, it's a resin de etra. It's a, the child is being sent down to this family, chosen chosen by the Rebbe Nishlam for this family, even up, according to Kabbalah, chosen by the child to be part of this family and chosen by the family to, to have this child. And therefore, the Gedele Shal basically encouraged very strongly to take home this child. It's a famous mice about a mishpocha in Geula, in Yerushalayim, that it was child, I think, number eight, had Down syndrome. On the way back from the hospital, they took the baby to Reb Chaim Kenevsky, and they said to him, we'd like a bracha that we should be able to find the right home to give this child away to. And Reb Chaim said, why are you giving the child away? And he said, well, we have a very small apartment, and it's the eighth child, and we don't have really room for this child with whatever equipment he's going to need and things. The Chaim replied, and if there was a healthy child, you'd have room? I said, mm, yeah. And the answer is, well, if they had room for a healthy child, you can have room for this child also. Obviously, we're not talking about a child that needs respirators and major equipment, and you know, you're know, you not converting a home into a hospital, into a hospital room. But it's um, a regular, so to speak, healthy child uh, with Downs. He said, take the child home. And the parents were very confused. They didn't expect that answer from him. So they sought out some chizah from Chaim. And Chaim said to them, Ershtens, the Rebetzin, this is when the Rebetzin was still alive, he said the Rebetzin used to say taking home with such a child is like a kameya in shtub. It's like an amulet that you're taking home and it's going to bring bracha to the house. Second of all, he says this child is going to come and bring, her, bring out enormous amounts of chesed from the rest of the children. The entire family is now going to be involved with doing chesed, with taking care of a child who needs more care, needs more attention, needs more chinuch, patience, love. And therefore, it's going to bring out more the gemidus than the other children. And it could be that because of the extra effort that they're going to expend on behalf of this child, that HaKadosh Baruch is going to protect them from different nesyoinus or yisurim that they were, were scheduled to have in their lives. Up patrim with them, they'll be able to to uh, to absolve themselves of whatever later you saw, and by taking care of that work that they did, the chesed they did in working with this sibling, and this child, this, the adult, the father was a now, big big Talmud Chochem. Rabbi Rabinowitz, do, does everybody agree? Because I understand that Skvera believes otherwise, and maybe other Hasidim disagree. Could you tell us the debate on this? Well, I, 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 the Skvera Rebbe is an Adam Godel Admoi, the tremendous Harocha for Skvera. Skvera tells people. The square Rebbe Zolvang Zutenstag tells people at birth, when it's Down syndrome, um, that they should give away the child. There are now a few families in Square that have kept their children. And Why? You know, Why does he? But what's his opinion? Like, what's the logic? So, so, so over the years, many, many people have gone to speak to the square Rebbe about this. 
And the only rational thing we get from the square Rebbe, well, first of all, he does feel that it's a tremendous difficulty and burden on the family, and that families can't handle it. But the, the reasons that he gave to Anoshim Gedolim who came to see him was, my great-grandfather would not have taken home these children, and therefore I also don't take home these children. It's a, a takeoff of not being critical of what they did in previous generations and not changing. It's very, it's very strong and not changing Minhagim, sticking to what was all the time. But there is that extra point of, yes, it is difficult for the Mishpachas. And in, in, if you create a society in which everybody is, who keeps a child is viewed in a negative way, and indeed you speak about the difficulties all the time, so then it is very difficult. But if you create an environment in which people speak about being oimid bin Asoyan and rising to the challenge, then it's not as difficult. There's a lot of, there's a lot of psychology in this whole issue. But the Rebbe, Lozayin Gizun, encourages people to give away with Down syndrome, primarily because he feels that the Oilam can't handle it, and because he says, many be saying to be a day. So let me ask you a question. Well, they wear boots in Skvara for that reason, don't they? Because the Menegav Yisenu. Yeah. Not, uh, if you go to Skvara in the summer, they wear boots. It's Menegav Yisenu. So let me ask you a question. I got this question from somebody with a, a child, a Down syndrome child, and he said to send to Hask, I think he said is eighteen thousand dollars a year for the summer. So he says I have two healthy children that don't have Down syndrome. He said I don't have money for all three. I could either send two kids for camp, it costs me seven or eight thousand dollars each, or I send the child with Down syndrome to camp, it costs eighteen thousand dollars. What do I do? You know, each case has to be this has to be viewed individually. There's a lot of funding sources for parents to send the children to summer camps for educational programs. New York, if they're residents of New York State, it's, it's, uh, New York State is the most generous of all the states in the country, but even other states chip in and pay in. And there are many funds, foundations, uh, UCP. There are plenty, plenty of avenues to try to be able to put together this money. I, I, but, but, but that's not the question. Let's assume in this particular case you say you have a hechi temtzeh, but I'm talking about he's asking a question that I'm sure replicates itself a thousand other times. How do you balance? I'm asking you. Yeah. You know, you, in, yeah, in the litter we didn't answer. In, 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 in the litter the we didn't answer Hachababaya So I'm asking you. His, his question is: How do I balance the the needs of this child, which will consume an inordinate amount of the parents' attention, right? And at the same time, not neglect the children who are healthy. And so he asked in a financial sense, and there may be answers to that. But you understand the gravitas of the question. No, absolutely. And the response that we first, the first response is, and if this child was suddenly a six, seven-year-old healthy child who suddenly had cancer and now needed enormous amounts of input and time, money, energy, and everything to be able to get refuas that you need. Let me ask you a question. What, what, do you ha- what happens, there's a study out, we're going to have on a doctor later, who says um, that there is a study that was recently done in a number of com- countries, and it's relatively new, that after the age of 40, and for men, this is the most astounding part of the study, after the age of 45, uh, there's a significant, according to one study, a 400% increase in the, char- in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the likelihood of having a Down syndrome child. Um, so have you spoken to Gedolim about, well, should women over the age of 40, should men over the age of 40, should they be thinking twice about having children, or is it a gather of, have, have you ever had that conversation? Well, the Rabbanu have had conferences about this. I am not familiar with this particular study, and and tell me about that. The you know the the study says that it's from the men's side also. That's astonishing. I thought it was astonishing, and they said that it's significantly more from the men's side. They said the women's uh, likelihood goes up by twenty five percent, and according to this new study, it's the male ch- that causes it by four hundred percent. That's okay. that's uh, sixteen times sure. greater a contributor than the woman. I was astounded by it. Yeah, I'm astounded too. I haven't, you know, I'd like to see the study. I haven't, I've never heard that part of the men on the men's side, but we know for sure that every single year, as a woman gets older, after 36, 38 years old, the likelihood of having a child with abnormalities or disabilities increases every single year. Um, and there are bottoms that have addressed it. And, and, and you know, what each person needs to have their rough and their poisic to get guidance from their rough and their poisic. There's no one-size-fits-all, and there's no one person 
or person, or Adam God, or the Kapaskin for everybody. I say the Charav, Rabbi Shmuel Kamenetsky says all the time, yeah, the person, every person has to make himself a Rav, and know the person, and they should know the Rav, and the Rav should know them, so that Rav will Paskin for them, he'll have the Si'ata, the Shmaya, that Hashem is going to grant to every Rav to Paskin for the, his, his constituents, his Talmidim, the people who come to him. So that's a major thing that people need to have Rav on him. With that said, in general terms, the conferences have been there, the, there are many, many Poiskim, especially in the Hasidic world, who have said that once uh, a family is large and a woman reaches past the age, some, some Dayonim say 36, some say 38, that they would strongly encourage that she take preventative measures in order to avoid having children with developmental disabilities because that would create a tremendous burden on them and the family. Um, others. Now, I just want to say for the record, I, I did call to Rebetzin Barkani, who's um, the head of Shai. And I spoke to a Mrs. Shweki, who's the head of both women who are going straight to Gan Eden, who's the head of the center. She has 500 children. And neither one could anecdotally say that they've noticed this, that the studies have said. So I know in, in medicine we don't go in of anecdote, but I thought it would be, I would be, um, I, I thought I would just mention that just for a fact. We will have the doctor on later who's an expert they in the don't, field. They don't see that, that, that there's a greater increase right. in older people. Yes, and I'm giving you the names. It's Rebitz and Barkani and Mrs. Are, Schwecki, I, I and they both said that they, anecdotally they do not notice it. They see a tremendous amount by younger children, even though both of the people I know who recently had children were both women in their 40s and men in their 40s. But she no. said anecdotally, she said she does not. It's not something that strikes her. There was no aha moment when I told it to her. Uh, no, there, there's certainly, uh, I mean, from my experience, there's certainly a prevalence in older people. What has happened in the last 25, 30 years is we've seen a much greater um, incidence of even a very young people, even people who are 20 years old giving birth to the first child of children with developmental disabilities. And when I asked this to Rav Matasio Salam and to Rav Shapiro, they both gave the same answer. We're holding in the days before Mashiach. HaKadosh says, Ein Mashiach bo ad she Yisroi kin kol anashom ashe beguf. There's a place in Shemayim called Guf. Ahechal anashomis. And until all these anashomis come down to the world and achieve whatever they're supposed to be achieving, Mashiach has to come. And so all of these, the tremendous increase in the, in the numbers and the percentages of birth but uh, let me just tell you, medically, if you would, it's not just, but it's the worldwide. And what they're saying is, is that there used to be three or four, what they would consider, like, if you have one of these three, four, we consider you developmentally uh, uh, um, indicative um, guide marks. We consider you developmentally disabled. And now there's 16. So they've just widened the road so much that so many more now cases that years ago would have been, oh, so he has this. I mean, everybody I know has some type of a disability. One guy has an anger disability. One guy has an attention. And when I was in yeshiva, they used to take a ruler and bang. And today it's become they've given it a label. So it's, it's a question is, is it really increasing or have we just made the road so wide? That's a, that's a good hakira. It's a good analysis to be able to speak to the uh, research experts to find out. But Let me ask you another like question. The from community is that the numbers are much greater much greater than the increasing proportion of births. So let me ask you a question, Rabbi Rabinowitz. You have children who are in Shaddach, and when somebody asks, you know, I want to go out with so-and-so's daughter or son, but they have a sibling who has Down syndrome, what's the appropriate response? The person I has a genuine interest, and they say, I don't know, is it genetic? Can I, can, if my kid, I, there's a halach, the Shulchan Aruch says in Simon Beis, a person shouldn't marry into a mishpachas nechfim. So if it's something that's genetically transmitted, if I care, the person says, I'm doing my halachic requirements, and they have a genuine interest. So how would you respond yeah, to that? You're in a lot of issues into one thing. Right. First of all, Down syndrome is not, in 99% of the cases, is not genetic. What is it? I, 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 some, you, I just explained to me. I'm, I'm ignorant. I'm an ignorant and layman. Brothers and there. It's a splitting. It's an extra chromosome that, in the splitting of the uh, in the splitting of the cells, an extra chromosome, you know, attaches itself, and it, that's the way it becomes a child with an extra trisomy trisomy 21. And it is 99% of the cases not genetic, and it can be tested to see in the blood test that's done confirmed Down syndrome. It can be determined if it's genetic or not genetic. And those, so therefore, if we deal with Down syndrome per se, Down syndrome generally is not generally overwhelmingly is not genetic. So would a parent have? Would a parent who's being read such a shidduch, would it be inappropriate for them to ask 
Did they do the blood test? Is it genetic? Can we speak to it? Would that be inappropriate or not? It's not inappropriate. It's just like it isn't inappropriate in any time you have any sort of an issue in a family. If there's a family that has a child who has a hearing issue or a child who has, a, who has, a, who has you know, any f- a physical deformity or something, you want to know whether it's genetic or not. You know, there's, today there's, you know, te- they, the Dari Sharma is testing for, for dozens and dozens of different genetic you know, possibilities. So the same way. We, we do, you know, we, we find out, we do our stadlis to find out whether or not this is a genetic issue. So, so a parent would just say, look, what does Darius Sharm say? And if they give me the blessing that it's not genetic, I'm fine. That would be the appropriate response, right? For a parent interested in marrying into a family that one of the children says, look, if it, what does Darius Sharm say? And if I got their bracha, basically at that point they did their hishtal, they did what they were supposed to do. I said there's no parent that should be hurt or embarrassed by the fact that somebody else wants to know if it's genetic. Okay, that's a good. Well, let me ask you another question. I'm sure as a, I'm asking you this as a mechanach, but as somebody who's spoken many times and is considered a worldwide expert in the sugya, if a parent would come to one of the gedolim and they say, my kid in vitrio was diagnosed, today they could do it, with having a severe disability, um, can I abort? Have you discussed this with the G'dayalim? What has the response been? And obviously it's very wide because severe disability could be from all the way from, you know, basically being in a vegetative state to somebody who's just a little bit impaired. So obviously I'm, I'm throwing at you, of, you know, not one softball but like 30. So, But give us some type of uh, what, what's been your experience at this. Well, there's basically two very strong schools of thought. You could take a look for extensive, extensive discussion of this. It's this yeah. Dr. Abraham yeah. Stvarin. He has extensively. And the two schools of thought are the... Um, Tetzel Yezer and Ramosha, yeah. Ramosha Feinstein, Shlem Zalman Orbach, Rebel Yoshev on one side, and Tetzel Yezer on the other side. Tetzel Yezer is, in certain cases, he himself writes, he must ask a shyly in each and every case. In certain cases, it will be permissible to terminate pregnancy even as late as seven months. Um, I, I believe in America, David Cohn follows the you know, follows and very often follows the Piske Halacha of the Sitzeliezer. Um The rest of the Poiskim, Reb Moshe and Reb Yoshev, and all very strongly felt that that, uh, that that would not be permissible um, unless the fetus itself was presenting uh, challenges to the mother and therefore would have a din of a roidef. But if we don't put the child into a category of being a roidef, then termination of pregnancy would not be permissible. That's in the general ways. Of course, again, every single thing needs to be analyzed for each mother and what the situation is, but those are the general guidelines that the, that exist in the world. Dr. Abraham, as a uh, somebody who was trained both by Iker Talmud of Shem Zalman, but also uh, very close to Yoshev and a Talmud of Naivert, he calls him Rabbi, and he writes at the end of the day, we have a Machalika Sapoiskim, and you're dealing with Dina Nefoshis. How how is it that any one poisik should now go paskin, you know that that uh, that you're allowed to terminate the pregnancy when there's so many huge kedoyim the paskin that it's mamish rotzicha that it's also well I, 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 if Rabbi Abraham was on the phone just for the record I would respond and we're having on Rabbi Ram Steinberg by the way after you today mm-hmm. so he is a great paisik but the response would be is that the sources that the Tzitzel Yezer bases on, basically a Tshuva Samarik, two Tshuva Samarik, that are for each other, etc. But seemingly, right. the majority of the Rishonim, with Nemon, with the exception of the Ramam, is that it's the Drabanan. And Safik Drabanan, you can go Lakula. That's how the Tzitzel Yezer would respond. All right, and so then Nishma Zavram has in his thing an extensive response to that. So, let me ask you another question. You mentioned in the beginning that the majority of Down children, Down syndrome children, become balei das. Does that mean that you could be mitzarif them to a minion, the mechayiv the mitzvahs, etc.? What's uh... well, tzarif to a minion is 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 a separate category of you know what's going on you know that particular time. The tzarif to a minion is is a subcategory of chayiv and mitzvahs. Um, it's not necessarily that every single person is mechayiv and mitzvahs. It could be mitzarif to a minion if he's chayiv uh, and mitzvahs. According to Shlomo Zalman, according to Bal is, is is a level of even vizarka kesef and nightla. He he can he can he can choose that which is valuable or precious and reject that which is insignificant. According to Chaim Kanievsky, it's even less than that. He just says ask a few, ask a few questions. Do they do they answer some some zach? Do they answer the question with a level of intelligence appropriate to that level appropriate to the question? And then they're considered bardas. The Reuven and Rudavid Feinstein have said that a person could be a bardas and chayiv in 613 
mitzvahs, there's no such a thing as being a chai even less than 613, but he could be an oinus on many of them because he's incapable of doing them. He's incapable of understanding the oimek mitzvahs. And as my Rebbe used to say, he says, um, main, and we think we do understand the depth of what tefillin's all about. Nevertheless, we all put on tefillin. So there's a... There's a, there's a uh, in the chiv of mitzvahs and the tzir of Timinyan, in the chiv of mitzvahs, so most of the children will be mechoyiv mitzvahs, or Moshe Feinstein writes this in his chubas also, that, with, that most of the children will be mechoyiv mitzvahs when they're 12 and 13, respectively, for males and females, and we have a chiv of mechanach, them to do what they can do, and little by little he writes, teach them to say shema, teach them to say brachas, and the Rosh writes in his chubas in a few places, and Nishma Savon brings things down also, and therefore, I want to say, that I, make, I make the statement that most of them will be mechoyiv mitzvahs, it's clearly that come out, most of the Paiskim that, that that we run our lives according to feel that they are mechoyiv mitzvahs. Whether or not the mitzvah of Tumiyan or not, that depends of a level That's of awareness of davening at that specific time. And what about getting ma- marriage? What about and having that? children of their own? What's, what's, what have well, the Gizayim said about that? If I'm not mistaken, the males can't have children. The males, males with Down syndrome can't have children. The females can. Um, women are not mechoyiv in Peruvu, so there's no din that I have to help. They have, they have to do that mitzvah. Are there cases in which there are people with Down syndrome who do get married? Yes. There are some cases in which the people who get married, most of them do not get married simply because they don't have the capacity to be able to uh, thrive, strive, keep up, understand, the, and have all the, all, the, all the tools necessary to, uh, to have that type of relationship. I'll tell you a vort from Rabbi Moshe Shapiro that's an incredible vort in, for it's disability related, but it's also incredible for the general public in marriage. When I spoke to him about uh, the idea of children getting married, so he said, um, I said, what are the criteria to decide, for me to help someone decide if the children can get married or not? So he said, marriage is not about giving. Marriage is about carving out a space within yourself for somebody else. So the children with Down syndrome are the most loving, giving people in the world. They will give everything to anybody. The more the amount of simcha and the sina. But I don't think that most of them are capable of carving out a place within themselves for somebody else. And therefore, they won't be able to have the relationship and they won't be shy to marriage. Um, some, there are many, many children who are a very high function, who want to get married. One has to discern, dis, dis, decide whether or not they really want marriage or what they really want is the party and the chas and the photographer and the, uh, and the albums. And what we're finding is that many kids just really want the party and they're happy with that. Once you make a big party for them, make them the center, they're, they're sufficing with that. And they don't really, when they keep saying they want to get married, they don't really understand what marriage is and that's not really what they wanted. Could you share with us the contents of the letter Amisha sent to you, the great letter? One of the things that Ramosha writes in the, that Ramosha Pierre writes in this letter is that the child that this child is for me is a tough kid for me. He's he's part of the reason that Kashbrocha created me in this world and there are parts of me that are that are all gonna have fulfillment because I'm living through and I'm 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 being oimed in the challenge of raising such a child. He says this child is an incomparable gift. I'm a ton of toiva. It's a tremendous gift that's gonna help me actualize potential within myself that nothing else in the world would be able would enable me to do. That means this child's gonna tap in and have forced me to work on my Muna, Twila, Betochen, Chesed, Midis, Aliyah connection to the Abish that nothing else in the world would inspire me to do it in the same way that this child would be able to do it. And the top gift of a person is to reach for his own shlemas. And Mamela, this child is then going to help me, and, and, it's, and it's a shliach of the rabbi, shlema matona from the Abish to go and to help me achieve, uh, achieve that. And then he focuses on two things. He says, number one is I have to focus on every iota of accomplishments and achievement that my child is going to make with the therapies, with the, with the matfilis, with the that we put in. Every little bit of, of relationship that he has with the world, every little, every little bit of Dependence that he establishes, his ability to decide, to think for himself. He says, this is kibush shel oilam mali. It's conquering an entire world. And he explained to me that in the eyes of the Rebbeinu shel oilam, he says, we don't know whose avoid is Hashem is greater. The child who's disabled, who's achieving tiny incremental uh, advancements in, in, in small things, or the person who's finishing shots for the sixth time. He says, the Rebbeinu shel has a cheshem for each and every person. If Neivert wrote the same thing. And whoever I could, and we have to stop and appreciate the godless of achievement and the small iotas of achievement that our children exist. And this is talk a very important, fundamental in, in developing a positive outlook on my child. Stop comparing him to other people. Don't compare him to what he could have been, should have been, would have been. In my eyes, rather, he's, he is the way I could have created him, and my job is to help him develop step by step to, to the best he could be. And I have to stop and appreciate that and look at that with pride. The second part of the letter is what. Rabbi, what Rabbi, I, Rabbi Rabinowitz, is, is it fair to say that? It's a, I think it's a big lesson for every one of us that 
the Rabbeinu Shalom doesn't compare me or you to Ramayshi Shapiro or to Maisha Rabbeinu or to Avram Avinu. He says, where are you coming from and what steps have you made in your life given your capabilities? And like the Mishal Sharm writes, I think in Shar Hasidus, he says, the simplest person who goes about his job with integrity and honesty can accomplish as much as somebody who's doing, who's, who's learning the holiest and holiest things. Is that sort of that message that Ramesh is giving for ch- these children, really? It's a message for all of us, too? It's a message for everybody, is that because Rebbe created, my Rebbe used to say, even a child who's a vegetable, who's a child in a crib who can't do anything for himself, he too has the right to say, Bishvili nivra ha'olam. The world is created for me. He's a tselem elokim, like every other tselem elokim. HaKadosh Baruch sent him down for a tafkit, for a purpose. He created him for a purpose. And he could say, Bishvili nivra ha'olam. Kishem shepar tzufeim kachadei Every single person is created. For, the whole world is created for that person. And our job is to bring out within myself and each of my children and, and whoever else I'm involved with in the world, that each person should achieve all the things that they can achieve. And what else did Rabbi Meisha write? The second thing in the letter is unbelievable. He writes that every single person is sent down to this world to fulfill its own tafkit for what it's, what it's supposed to be doing. Most of the people are sent down to this world primarily to fix themselves, be misaka themselves, correct themselves, work on themselves, and also to have some influence on the people around them according to their ability and the circumstance. However, there are neshamas in the world that cannot independently reach their own tikkun. They can't independently correct and do whatever, what they were sent down to this world. And why were they sent down to this world? He said the primary purpose is not because they need tikkun. The primary purpose of what they sent, were sent down to this world is that they were given a schus to come down to this world so that they can achieve higher levels in the world to come, even higher than the, where they came from. And if they're sent down to this world, they were sent down. They are loft, extremely lofty neshamas. Gvoyos hein b'meyuchat. And they don't need a ticket. And their entire purpose of being sent down to this world is for the people around them, for their family members, for the neighbors, for the doctors, the therapists, the people. Anyone is going to have a shaykhist to them in their lives. L'sakein es vivasam, that the people around them should reach their ticket. This loft in Hashemah, he says, is sent down for us. And therefore, we need to be makabal bi'av or rabba to which help this neshama achieve its tafkit, which it was sent, its shlichus, which it was sent. And therefore, as he blesses us, that we should, we should achieve it. We should help that neshama achieve its purpose, and we should also be able to achieve our purpose, which we were sent into this world. That's the fundamental principles of the letter that he wrote. And how, you, I imagine you've read this letter at various, you know, um, seminars, et cetera, people... What is the reaction this letter has had? People are stunned. People are stunned to think that my child, who could be, who could, who could be the most disabled, forget about Down syndrome. It's not just about Down syndrome. This could be any type of developmental disability. I'm telling you, even the child who's not capable of doing anything for themselves, that they are a their neshama is gevoya same b'miyuchad, extremely lofty neshamas, and he explained to me many times way higher than me and you. He's asahech of nuns. The neshamas are mamish way up there. And their purpose of being sent down is not that I should be taking care of them, but they were sent down for me and for everyone around us to reach our hashlama, to reach us, to reach a certain perfection within our own avodah Hashem. Rabbi Baku Meishechta, one of the gedolim in Eretz Yisrael, the heads of the Breslau in Yishalayim, who's himself, he has eight out of his nine children have major issues, and he's the person that I go to often to speak to, speak to, in the, you know, the Muna Bitocha on these, uh, this whole topic. And he said that the children are sent down to Unzer and Mishpachis. And a family that could take care of the child, if they worked hard and they pulled into themselves, he says, that's their mission. And if they, if they voluntarily, because of pressures or because of not thinking it through properly, make a decision not to raise their own child, he says, then they're not achieving their tafkid in this world. And whatever ramifications they're in, they're going to have to, they're going to, have to live with. So, Rabbi Rabinowitz, in closing, would you say, well, how has your child enriched your family? Uh, Shlomo is unbelievable. He's in Rishna family, and, and first of all, he has an infectious nonstop. Simcha Sachayim. Everything is okay by him. There's never a time when he when he gets down. He's Be'etzim, a child with Down syndrome, but he never gets down. Everything by him is, is, is Freyla. And again, not all disabilities share the same attribute, and not all kids with Down syndrome necessarily share the same attribute, but he, he himself has this attribute. He's taught us emuna. He's taught us Simcha Sachayim. He taught us Kalmadevit Rahman Litavovit. 
um, he's brought an appreciation of simple things into life. And there are people, you know, people in yeshiva when he when he davens, they watch him daven. He davens with such devotion and intensity and connection to the Abishta. We're awed by it. We're inspired by it. He's a bachel who's now wearing tefillin for 16 years, except once when he was not well. He never has spoken Dvar Batalin with his tefillin on. He made that a mission. He made it a goal. He made it a focus. We worked for two years in advance of, of Bar Mitzvah to, to, to work on these in Yonim. He embedded it. He incorporated it, and he does it. It's such a Musa lesson to us of what we can do when we're focused and determined and we, and we make Kabbalahs on ourselves of how much Kaisis we really have within ourselves to be able to accomplish things. He's brought a tremendous amount of chesed to the family, of media sensitivity and compassion to every one of my children, that they're more compassionate. And Moshe writes this, we spoke about this at length, that generally speaking, if families handle it right, this child is going to raise the level of midas, sensitivity, compassion, and munna from all of the other children in the family. If it's done right, it's a muir digabracha to a family. It takes work, it takes time, it takes guidance. It's not simple. It's an avoida. It can be very difficult at times. But the sum total result is that it makes us into better avde Hashem and fulfilling rats and Hashem in a much in a much higher way and we become just better people for that. You know, more 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 the hybrid people fulfilling more of our tafkid. Rabbi Rabinowitz, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Call to Vatlar. We have on the phone with us from Los Angeles, Dr. Elon Shapiro, who's an expert in public health, who's frequently quoted on CNN, NBC, has done research and published on Down syndrome and other diseases. Welcome, Dr. Shapiro. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. So, Dr. Shapiro, what are the risks, if any, increased risks of uh, of mothers and fathers having children at a later age, and what is that age? Walk us through it. Well, uh, there's a couple of things. We have the physical part, the mental health part, and actually what's going to happen in the future. A lot of the times, when, when I'm going to start with the moms. When a mom starts actually having um, a, a kid uh, after 40, um, uh, the, the physical part of the mother actually is exposed to more um, uh, hormones and these hormones, a lot of the tumors that are repressed uh, or actually driven on the uterine area or cervical area, can response can have an amazing response to uh, hormones. Then the probability of actually having cancers or other type of problems related to these hormones, uh, like um, you know having clots on on the legs or in the lungs, actually increase a lot. One of the other things that we have is after birth. Um, the moms can actually have something called uh, pregnancy cardiomyopathy. Um, that means that, you know, the heart actually gets bigger and enlarged after the pregnancy. And that's actually a problem because we all need our hearts to be working. Um, and the other thing that we, we can have is, you know, the, 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 the per se, you know, the, the, the structures inside of the stomach and the uterine walls can actually rupture easily and the, the body is it's not in tune with that part. Then it creates like a lot of problems from hormones, from the heart, from the muscles, from a lot of the the, the chronic things that you know uh, to recover are, are not the same as when they, they when we are actually less than forty. Okay, what about so you're saying as far as the mother, there's an increase of cancer and other complications post forty. What percentage increase would that be? Uh, it, it's very important to know that you know it depends actually from from age to age. Uh, there's like different cutoffs, and a lot of the information that we have is from from people and patients that actually have been going through uh, hormone um, hormone treatments, and we have seen different different uh, different indices and prevalences depending on what type of uh, age they have. And it's really, so let's really, say post really 40, hard to like is it an increased yeah. chance of one percent, a half a percent, five percent? No, like... it's actually it's it, it's more than that. For example, for the heart stuff, it's more than twenty five percent. That you know, oh, people my. that have that type of problems is actually twenty five percent. The 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 increased part of the cancer depends on family history, but you know, if you have an Ashkenazi background and stuff like that, that actually increases more, like uh, around like ten to fifteen percent. Then you start like adding all these little things. Um, to the maternal health, and you know, um, and, and it adds up, and, and you know, it's putting it. You, it, you know, we, whenever you need to take the decision, you need to understand that there's a higher risk uh, for you and actually the health of your baby. 
The other thing that can now, actually happen is Let's talk about is that, autism yeah. and Downs. What, what are the odds of increase after 40, both for the mother and the father? Well, there's as far as the child, what is the, the increased possibility of having one uh, after the age of 40? Yeah, it, it's getting close to one to four. You know, it, it, you know, you, you start reducing after 40. You know, you, you're getting, you know, a, a 10 to 20 percent probability of actually having a kid with with uh, Down syndrome. And um, and not what only is, that, what does one to actually, four mean? I didn't understand that, doctor. Tw- tw- t- around around 25 percent. 25% of children after the age of 40 will be either down or autistic? Yeah, the, the numbers, the, not, not autistic. The autistic actually but it changes a lot and depends on the age of the father too. But we can actually go to that part too. But um, on, on reality, the, 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 the closer you get to 40, 45, you start like going from 1 to 1,000 1, to 1 to 300 to 1 to 30. Uh, to 30 to actually you know above 45 to to actually one in four then you know that the possibilities of creating a problem genetic problem is they're really really high that's an astonishing statistic you go from when they're in their 20s to one in a thousand to 45 is one in four yeah yeah okay so that that's a frightening statistic no correct and and you say the fathers um, uh, increase the chances too. Can you explain to us that research? Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I, you know, when we have, you know, a, a lot of the times, you know, one there's a lot of advantages in, in life of having parents that are already mature, that they, they have like a nice economical background. But it, it's very important to understand that, you know, like with, with uh, parents that are older, specifically with males, there's a correlationship with autism. The older, the old, and we do not understand specifically where is the problem or where, if, if, where, where actually is the specific problem with the proteins or the sperms, or we do not know specifically where it's coming from. But there's a correlation with older fathers and actually kids that have autism. Then um, that that's that that that's hard to, to to understand, and and it's important to understand that part that. It's not just you know that uh, when moms actually are older that uh, the kids can actually have Down syndrome, but you know the the father actually plays a role too with with autism. And and can you tell us uh, what are the increased chances? Like a father who's 25 or a father who's 45, what is the, how do the odds increase? It, it, sadly, at this moment I don't, do not remember, but I will gladly send you the information that way you have it on on your uh, website. Okay, I believe in the article. It said something like there was a four to six hundred percent increase, which means uh, I don't know the odds. What, like what percentage of of children born when young parents are autistic? Do you know that? Uh, r- right now, we we're seeing a uh, you know we we're actually raising uh, a lot of uh, compared to past years. We're we're increasing like sixty four percent of the patients that we're seeing more often, meaning that uh, it's it, it's one in six. Uh, just to give a round number, from 100 kids that are born, uh, around uh, four to five will have some type of uh, autistic traits. Um, then the older you get, and especially you know with, with with the number that you mentioned, you know it, it's ca- kind of doubling the probability of your kid to have autism. Then you're playing with serious numbers. Wow. So in closing, doctor, you say that if parents have children over the age of 40, uh, the, the risks are as high as one in four in Downs, and in, and as far as autistic, it could be as, as uh, well, you, we don't have an exact number, but it's substantially higher. It could be, you said you'd provide us, substantially higher than if they were in their younger years. Correct. Then you're, you're putting, uh, you know, it, it needs to be a, a conjoint effort between the mom and dad and actually figuring out the risk for, for both of them and for, for the kid to make a, a important and, and, and smart decision on, on how to achieve and perceive this uh, as a pregnancy. Well, doctor, thank you very much for your time. Oh, it has been a, a very, very pleasure. Um, and, uh, is there any doctor? Gladly... Is there anything that I didn't ask you that you think I should, or some comment that you would like to make? Maybe, you know, I asked you pointed questions. Is there any part of it that we're missing that you think that you would like to share? Uh, yes, you know, the, the 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 other thing that we need to think of is, you know, miscarriage. You know, the older you get, the mom actually can can have more miscarriages. Um, the other one is, you know, the blood pressure and, and the diabetes risk go up. 
Um, and, uh, you know, there's other things regarding the placenta that is actually the bag between uh, the baby and the mom. The, this bag can actually, uh, the older you get, the, the quality of the placenta and the uterine wall changes and can, can lead to a lot of, uh, of bleeding. Um, the other thing is that babies can actually, imagine that they don't have, um, you know, autism or, or any type of syndrome, they end up having a lot of, uh, um, you know, they can be actually having low w weight at birth, and the other one is actually they can be premature when, when they are born. Um, and, and, and just correcting the number that I, that I told you about the, the, the Down syndrome is 1 in 30 at 45. It's very important. Yeah, it's not 25%. I remember that the, the number between 25 and 30, but it's actually one in 25 or 30 patients that will have a uh, Down syndrome. So it's four percent. Okay. It is. It, it's yeah. It's yeah. Around that. Okay. Well, doctor, thank you very much for your time. No, uh, you're welcome. And, and it's very important that everybody, ha you know, to create that conversation with your doctors and with the family to figure out. What's the best thing for for your body and the safety of your body? And meaning, you know, if, if you you need to take care of yourself before taking care of another person, and you know, you don't want to put that your your, your entire life at risk, or, or your family uh, life at risk. Uh, and it's very important to have that conversation with your doctor. Thank you very much, Doctor Shapiro. All the best. Oh, it's a pleasure. We have the honor of having with us on the phone from Nevada, Doctor Erin Hankey who's an expert, she's a neuropsychologist at the Center for Autism and Devent De Developmental Disabilities. Welcome, Dr. Hanke. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. So Dr. Hanke, our discussion is, does a parent's age, both the mother and the father, create an increased risk for autism? What are the, what's the, what are the, fa what are the scientific facts vis-a-vis -vis anecdotal evidence? Okay, so we've, uh, seen previous studies um, that have had in, inconsistent results really based on either father's age or mother's age. And more recently, um, we've seen some international studies, um, some very, very large studies that have taken both mother's age and father's age. And it shows that actually after the age of 50 as a father, there's a 66% increase in the risk for developing autism. Um, mother, um, after 35 or 40 years old, there's also an increased risk for autism. Um, now what's interesting is not only advanced age in both of the parents uh, have increased the risk for autism it's showing in studies, but also um, younger mothers, uh, which this is new information, uh, has shown that this is an increase for the risk of autism, uh, autism disorder as well. You're saying a younger mother with an older father, is that what you're saying? Yes. So younger mother, um, as in addition to older father, especially after that 10-year age gap as well. Okay. So what would that mean? Let's say, <clears throat> now there are other studies I've seen online that it could be as much as uh, six times higher for men. So it seems that it's is it inconsistent. Are there different studies? I'm curious. Yes. So there are several different studies, just recent studies, um, that you know there is an increased risk, and I've seen uh, you know about a third to sixty some percent increased risk. And really, they're looking at. Um, uh, a link to uh, genetic mutations that occur as the father and mother um, age, so in the sperm and uh, uh, cells in the mother as well. So, now is this only autism, or does it, it other you know uh, you know other uh, mutations as well for other diseases? I've seen a few studies um, that really look at. Uh, the occurrence of uh, Down syndrome. I've also seen a few studies that uh, discuss the in increased risk for uh, different types of cancers in children. Now, so what does that mean? Like, try to give me like a number wise. Let's say you have a thousand children. What would the increase in number like? How likely does it like? You know, if it goes from, you know, one in a thousand to one and a half in a thousand, it, it, it's a big increase, but it's not. It doesn't really. That doesn't materially change anything. Does this materially change something? 
Well, I mean, when you're looking at such large numbers, it doesn't seem like that big of an increase. And really the studies uh, that are out there right now and the most recent studies really stress that although it seems like it is a large increase in risk, still, you know, looking at these large numbers, it's not that big of a risk when you're looking at the occurrence with the aging parents. So the, the study I'm looking at here, which is, I guess, off the Internet, WebMD, says it, it's 60 per 10,000 births. And it's, WebMD says, which is six times higher than the rate found among couples under 35 years old. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. 60 per 10,000 births, 1% uh, of 10,000 would be a hundredth, so it's six-tenths of a percent. So given that number, would you say that, you know, it's still, uh, you know, it's one -tenth, you know, six-tenths of a percent means it's one out of every, let's say, 180 kids. Would mm -hmm. you say that that should be a significant uh, issue for parents thinking of having a kid, or would you say it's too remote for them to really worry about it? And is my, are my numbers right? I mean, that's what I'm curious. Um, well, those numbers are correct. Um, the most recent numbers as far as looking at uh, children in all as far as an autism spectrum disorder and the occurrence of that, I believe it's a 1 in uh, 59 right now. Um, wow. So 1 in 59 yeah. is the latest number is 1 in 59 chance of having it either. And that's what, after the age of what? Um, you know, it doesn't actually uh, discuss about the age as far as uh, parental age. Just overall, one in 59 children are um, assumed to be on the spectrum. That's when the, when when the you're talking about all kids or kids when the parents are older. All children. So if 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 the chances according to WebMD are six x for men and women over the age of 40, does that mean it's wow? That would make a very if one in 60. That means it would be one in 10 in effect over that age. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it should be something, I mean, I would say it, it would be something that you should keep in the back of your mind if you're deciding to have children, um, but there are other risk factors uh, for developing autism spectrum disorder as well as other neurodevelopmental disorders, um, and, and we know that those are environmental risks uh, as far as exposure to toxins, trauma, um, there's also biological risks, um, and there's uh, several you know, other things that can be risk factors for these uh, types of disorders. Um, but, yes, definitely uh, if you're thinking about having children, that is one thing that I would think about is, you know, having a child, especially as a female, because after the age of, you know, 35 and older, uh, women are really in that, quote, at-risk category of having children with other uh, disabilities or disorders. So... I would definitely keep it in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is it taking so long for studies on this to come out? I really think that just from looking at all of the research, all you know, especially with international studies or even in the United States, uh, the definition of autism is is general. So you have social delays, repetitive behaviors, um, but across the board internationally. Um, people diagnose differently, and there's also many different factors that can be risks for developing this disorder. So I believe that there's so many factors that need to be controlled for, and it, with such a large population, it's hard to control for that or even, you know, decide which factor that they want to look at as far as a risk. Haha. Uh -huh. Now, here's a quote from Dr. Elan Shapiro. It's, again, from WebMD and Healthline.com. And he said the following. Tell me whether you, could, um, whether you agree with it. He says, a 25-year-old has a 1 in 1,064 chance of having a child with Down syndrome. He says, a 40-year-old has a 1 in 19 chance, which is an astonishing number. Yes. Right. And then he says miscarriages go from 9% when parents are 20 to 24 years to 75% for a 45-year-old or above. The rate of stillbirth doubles when mothers are over 35 years of age. Are these facts that are generally accepted in medicine? 
Um, I have seen uh, similar rates as well in, in different research. Again, you know, there are going to be different uh, different rates per different study, but generally those seem to be um, pretty consistent with what's out there. So would you say that it's safest to have children when both parents are younger and the older they get, the risks increase uh, uh, somewhat dramatically? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Hanke, thank you very much for your time. Of course. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Let's go to the chosen winner of this week's riddle. Hi, Dr. David. This is Mendel Sasunkin. Um, I answered your Shiloh last week. Uh, first of all, thank you for the compliment and calling me Holy uh, Um So answer to both your riddles this time. Number one, we're going to get to the Rambam. Then he says that, had locus neiris kshere bizarim. So, first of all, the Gemara and Yuma, the Afchavdal, it says, Hadlaka ain't Aveda, Hadlaka is not the Aveda. The reason for that being that it's Oilo Me'eleho, it's not real, the person's not really doing much, or Shalhavas is Oilo Me'eleho. And from Daik and the Rambam, he says, Im heiti vakoyin haneiris, vheitsiyan lachot, muta lazal hadlikan, meaning that the Hatava, which is the Iker Aveda, has to be done bifnim by the Kayan. And the lighting, which is not really an Aveda, can be done by the Zar outside. So, Lechorda, there's no Hadlaka Isa Mitzvah, it's Bechlal, not, it's not even an Aveda. Answering the second Shaila, Benegea to the Luches Shniyais, and Yom Kippur, and bringing it down. So, first of all, the Ragat Shavar on Alatayra, and also in the Shot, you could, in Alatayra, it's in Ekev Semin Yud, he says, that Hayyasa was Yom Kippur, Muzayin, that he only brought the Luches down after. So he left them on the Har, he says. So he took it in and bring them down on Yom Kippur. The Lubavitcher Rebbe says that you could say that um, the whole Indian of Yom Kippur was only Neschadish once the Yidin got, were already Mechabal the Luches Shniyas. So Hayyasa that on the Yom Kippur that Moshe Rabbeinu actually came down with them like it didn't, they didn't have the luches then yet. So later on in the day, you could say that like the din of Yom Kippur wasn't chal and the Isser Tiltal wasn't there also. But the Rebbe says you also could say you could counter that and say that Moshe Rabbeinu was the shliach of the Yidin to kabbal the Torah and the luches on the har. So maybe his kabbalah of the luches, even though the Yidin didn't get it yet, so maybe it was chal. So it's both ways. There are others apparently that say that um, it was Lamaila Masvara Tzvachim, maybe he kept it, I guess, Lamaila Masvara Tzvachim, but the Rebbe says, I guess, I'll be Pimis and Yonim, the whole Indian of Matan Torah, that it should come down to this world, so he likes the Ragachavar's answer better, or that there was no Isar Tiltal because the Yidin weren't Makabal, the Luchas yet. Uh, Zeige sind ja schon